Ikea or custom cabinets. Today I want to look at a real world example. But before I get started, a huge thank you to everybody who took part in our poll, whether you just answered or you commented below. That is driving a lot of the discussion for today's video. A bit of background before we get started. I have a local client who has an older home and it's ready for an update. Not unlike many of you, I'm sure. Particular challenge to this home and this kitchen though is the size. The main kitchen area is hemmed in its current footprint. On the left hand side, the wall is shared with the basement stairs and back entrance. While the stairs could be relocated, it's simply not worth opening up that can of worms for this particular house. On the opposite side of the kitchen, the wall is shared with the main bathroom. Once again, this meant that this wall isn't going anywhere. Finally, the last wall of the kitchen divides the space from the rest of the main living area. It extends slightly towards the dining room and in front of the back entrance. While we could knock this wall out, it would come with a pretty substantial cost. Its load bearing would require a pretty major beam across the middle of the house and it simply wasn't worth it from that side. What it's worth, we did explore this as an option in the early stages, some very simple design work, but it wound up creating some awkwardness in the living room side in terms of TV and furniture placement, and it axed a lot of our good storage on the kitchen side, so we axed the idea. Next, I wanna to touch on some of the goals, the design features, the elements, the must-haves, whatever you wanna call them for this particular project. First, a traditional feel, but wrapped in a modern envelope. I would classify this somewhat like a transitional design, but in all honesty, that's a bit of a catch-all term. Second, wood fronts for the base cabinets. Now, this alone puts a bit of a damper on the IKEA option. I've said it before, I'll say it again, the options from IKEA simply aren't great. They aren't where they need to be to keep up with market demand. I had laminate wood cabinets down in my kitchen for a, almost 10 years, and we just never really were happy with them. We settled when we first did the kitchen. This meant in this particular design, we'd be looking at aftermarket doors for at least the base cabinets. Third, we needed to maximize storage in the space. With such a small footprint and only so much square footage to work with, none of it could be simply wasted. It doesn't mean we had to fill every square inch of space, but everything needed to be used efficiently. The fourth and final is to minimize the movement of mechanicals. This is gonna save on the budget end of things, and truth be told, there's not a lot we can do in the current footprint in terms of relocating stuff anyways. So let's kick things off with the IKEA design. And first and foremost, the layout, the organization, the aesthetic can all be created with IKEA. There are just a few constraints. Starting with the sink wall, we could center the sink cabinet under the new window placement. There was some exterior work done and the window shifted a few inches, so this is where things shook out. To the right of that, we added a standard drawer bank, and then you'll see a blank corner off to the right hand side, which we'll address a little bit later on. The real sticking point lies on the left hand side of the sink. You'll notice there we only have roughly 31 inches of space left, and using stock IKEA pieces, this would mean a 7 inch filler piece before the corner cabinet. There is a bit of a trick that can be used, where you take a 5 inch IKEA drawer front and flip it vertically, thus creating a 5 inch cabinet. There's a surprising amount of stuff you can do with 5 inches of storage. The problem? This is entirely custom, and would need to be created by the installer either from scratch or by modifying a 12 inch cabinet. As I mentioned, we left the other corner as dead space in both the IKEA design and you'll see in the custom cabinet design later on, this was purposeful and meant to be done to get a good bank of drawers in the main kitchen area. When it comes to the wall cabinets on the sink wall, nothing fancy here, standard cabinets spaced evenly on each side of the window. The range wall didn't require too much finagling. We could use stock IKEA cabinets all the way across, 12 inch pullouts on each side of the stove, one with IKEA's two tier pullout, and one potentially with an aftermarket organizer. There's a blind corner cabinet on the wall, maximizing use of the corner for non everyday item storage, a 20 inch above the range cabinet, and low profile over the range microwave, finishing it off with a 12 inch cabinet to cap off the run. If you remember back to the layout, I can't take cabinets too far down this range wall because it hinders the main entryway to the kitchen. So the 80 inches or so we have with a little bit of wiggle room on either side is sort of what we're stuck with. Moving to the opposite side of the kitchen, what I'll call the dishwasher wall, I didn't want to leave another base corner empty in the kitchen. Therefore, we had to use something from Ikea, some sort of corner base cabinet to fit that space. There are really only two main options. Their square one requires about 38 inches of space in each direction. We don't have that on the sink wall. Their blind corner cabinet on the other hand requires 47 inches of space. 
we don't really have that on the dishwasher wall. In this case, we only have a hair over 45 inches. Thankfully, there is enough space at the back of these cabinets to modify them and still leave room for internal organizers. Be it IKEA's Le Mans style Lazy Susan or an aftermarket option like Revashelf's Corner Pull Out. Rest of the base cabinets or the rest of the base section for this wall is taken up by the dishwasher and an end panel. And while it's never ideal to locate the dishwasher away from the sink like this, we can get away with it in this kitchen, A, because we have no other choice, and B, because of how all the plumbing runs underneath the kitchen. Looking at the wall section here, nothing fancy has been done. Standard 40 inch tall IKEA cabinets can be used here as well. Finally, the fridge wall is what will be pantry storage and extra countertop space. I used a filler panel to push the fridge away from the kitchen entrance, squeezing out as many of those extra inches as possible, base drawers for organization, and standard wall cabinets for storage. One thing I'll note here is pantry storage doesn't need to be your typical pantry style 90 inch tall cabinet. It can be whatever works best for you. For my client, there's a greater need for the extra countertop space, and the wall cabinets above and base drawers below can still act as the main pantry for the kitchen. Now for pricing, it's something I'm sure you're interested to see how it shakes out IKEA versus custom cabinets. For this particular kitchen, if I went stock IKEA parts, so their doors, their boxes, their panels, all of that, it would range somewhere between seven and $10,000. The range here depends entirely on doors and panels. If you went with something like the Ankoping, which is more of a fiber and thermofoil finished door, it's gonna shake out around that $7,000 mark. However, if you pushed the envelope and went to something like Ikea's Vedham door, which is mostly solid wood, it's only a veneered panel in the center, it's gonna push that cost up to around the $10,000 mark. Ankoping has matching white and wood doors, so you'd have identical faces. The Vedham doors, on the other hand, don't have a matching partner, so the closest option here would be something like the Axted White. The problem for this project is we wanted solid wood fronts for the base cabinets in a stain a little bit deeper than that Vedham provides. That means we had to look at aftermarket options to fill that need. When going this route, a couple quotes came back around the $2,500 mark for those base cabinet doors and panels and toe kicks, everything we would need to finish those off, pushing the total cost of this kitchen over $12,000. Now remember, that's cabinets only. There is no installation with that. Taking a little bit of a tangent, I had a comment on our poll that asked how we can achieve that custom look in a kitchen or elevate our IKEA kitchen to the next level without the custom price tag. This is by no means a stock IKEA kitchen. There are some modifications and some custom elements that take advantage of the IKEA system while still maximizing storage in the space, be it that five inch door front or cutting down the blind corner cabinet. Both of these are perfect examples of how you can modify your kitchen to use IKEA and elevate it to the next level. Another method I've used in the past is to include built-in shelving units or custom-built range hoods. I've even gone to the extent of using millwork around all of the cabinets to achieve the custom look without the price tag, or at least part of your price tag. The catch is that all of these modifications are going to drive up the price of your kitchen. There is no way around it. Skill and craftsmanship takes time and time costs more money. Now moving on to the design using the custom or semi-custom cabinets for this kitchen. I say semi-custom because we're still using a lot of standard kitchen cabinet sizes. Now I like to do this because those standard sizes help reduce some of the cost and it can prevent or minimize some of the potential issues that'll pop up during install with really custom measured cabinets. Starting on the sink wall, you'll see not much has changed. There's still a 30 inch sink cabinet underneath the window and a bank of drawers to the right. That bank of drawers has changed a little bit in its rearrangement and that's simply because we can change the drawer depths when we go custom. So in this particular case, we're using six inch drawers for the top three, which then leaves a 12 inch deep drawer for the bottom. I find 12 inches to be a little bit more functional than say a 15 inch drawer, which is what we would have to use from Ikea for this particular width of a cabinet. I still have the five inch pullout to the left of the sink cabinet as well. The benefit here is we can make a proper cabinet without needing to alter an existing particle board box from Ikea. Finally, the right hand corner remains empty. Just like with Ikea, this needs to be done to include a proper bank of drawers. I won't spend a ton of time on the range wall because it's essentially identical. 12 inch pullouts on each side of the range and standard wall cabinets above. The sizing has changed a little bit, but nothing overly critical. The one thing I will mention is we can shed all of those cover panels, which gains us a little bit more space at that kitchen entrance. On the opposite wall, the biggest change comes in the blind corner cabinet. Once again, I can get a cabinet built to fit the spot. 
Going a step further, I can add another drawer into this cabinet as well. The blind corner cabinet here will have an 18 inch door front, which allows the majority of aftermarket organizers to fit and exit comfortably. Finally, the fridge wall, and while overly still pretty much the same design as the IKEA, there has been a bit of tweaking done to the fridge cabinet. I can now spec a slightly wider cabinet above the fridge, compared to the standard IKEA 36 inch wide option. This allows the fridge a little more room for ventilation. If you were to look at most fridge installation packets, you'll see that the manufacturer recommends roughly half an inch of room on each side for ventilation. However, most 36 inch fridge models actually shake out around 35 and 5 eighths inches, leaving a pretty tight fit underneath the 36 inch cabinet. So it'll fit perfectly underneath IKEA's cabinets and in between those end panels you'll put, it just doesn't quite meet the installation guidelines. Now, I've done this for years without any problems whatsoever. I haven't blown any fridges up more than any other situation. It's just something to be aware of. Finally, the drawer configuration is altered again to take advantage of a six inch top drawer with dual 12 inch deeper drawers below. With Ikea, you're stuck choosing a combination of five, 10 or 15 inch depths when it comes to their drawers. Now for pricing, the base package from the particular builder we're going with, as well as a couple others, shook out between $12,000 and $12,500. Now to upgrade those bottom drawer fronts and door fronts to solid wood, it came in around another $2,000, bringing our total somewhere between fourteen and fourteen and a half thousand. But here's the kicker, that included installation. One thing I have learned after years of installing IKEA kitchens and spent years designing kitchens for others to install, a lot of contractors simply don't like IKEA. What you'll often hear them say is that it's terrible quality or it's the worst crap you can buy, but what it often boils down to is they simply don't want to take the amount of time and patience it requires to finish well. No longer are they just putting a cabinet box on the wall. They now need to assemble it, they need to hang it, and then they need to cut cover panels to fit nicely on each end. Those cover panels need to be scribed and fit perfectly so that the kitchen doesn't have a shoddy finish. This is by no means a knock against IKEA's quality and their kitchen system. I really do think it's fantastic for the price point for a lot of people. However, it is worth kicking around the idea of custom or semi-custom cabinets when it comes time to finish your kitchen. If you're willing to put in the legwork and find those local builders, sometimes you can create a better option for your space. Jumping back to price now, and with all that being said, the quotes I received to install the IKEA kitchen ranged anywhere from a couple thousand to over $5,000. In both these cases, it brings the total cost up beyond what it would cost to have those custom cabinets built and installed. Let's move on to fit and finish. And it's important to get out of the way and remember, anytime we're having this conversation, we're comparing apples to apples. Cabinet boxes from Ikea are three quarter inch melamine and particle board, pre-cut, pre-finished, and ready to assemble. The boxes from the local cabinet builder will also use three quarter inch melamine. However, in their particular case, we'll have a nice top piece to that box as opposed to Ikea's protruding rails. Another quick tangent here, because Ikea's rails stick above the cabinets by roughly an eighth of an inch, you need to use fixa brackets on every cabinet frame if you plan to install heavy countertops. These brackets transfer the load directly from those countertops into the cabinet frame. This is an example of one of those extra steps that annoys contractors. It's just something that needs to be done in order to maximize the use out of those Ikea cabinets, and it's just not something you have to do from a typical cabinet builder. Ikea's drawer boxes use metal sides with a half inch melamine base. The custom builder uses the same three quarter inch melamine to build all of his drawer boxes, including the bases. This means we should wind up with a slightly sturdier drawer from the builder versus Ikea. I'll also mention that I've never had any issues with Ikea's drawers. I have one in my kitchen that's full of cast iron bakeware and it's probably over the weight limit recommended by Ikea. We've never had any issues. But what can get annoying is those rounded metal edges that are in each cabinet waste a little bit of space compared to just a straight side. And if you're not using their internal organization trays or dividers, they are quite noticeable. Most sets of cabinet features hardware from Bloom for soft close hinges and soft close drawer slides. So something that I'm not really worried about in either case and they're both gonna be equally good. When it comes to the door fronts, whether it was the IKEA design or the custom design, all of the white cabinets would have been a thermofoil finish. I find thermofoil tends to hold up a little better when it comes to daily wear and tear, 
and it tends to be a little bit easier to clean over, say, a painted cabinet. There are some exceptions to this in the paint world with paints that can hold up equally well to thermofoil. They're just more of the exception to the general rule. When it comes to the base cabinets, on the other hand, though, the aftermarket doors for Ikea's probably would have wound up being some sort of veneer, where we get a rather big upgrade in solid wood fronts with the local builder. One of the other questions asked underneath that poll is how are they going to hold up in the long run? And truth be told, they should both hold up really well, whether we went IKEA or custom for this particular project. I've had IKEA kitchens in my investment properties and client projects and in my own kitchen for going on 10 years. And other than not liking those initial doors we put in our base cabinets, the rest of the kitchen is in incredibly good shape, especially for how much use it goes through daily. The biggest benefit to the custom cabinets here will be those solid wood drawer fronts and door fronts for the base cabinets. It's really hard to beat a solid wood with a stained natural grain when it comes to durability. It just tends to hide those nicks and scratches if they occur really well. As for the hardware, all that metal inside that makes the kitchen function every time you open a drawer or close a door. I'm not worried about in either case, both instances use fantastic hardware and I trust them in all of my designs. When it comes to Ikea, I think the durability lies in their doors. Some doors simply don't hold up as well as others, and once that wear and tear starts showing on the doors, the whole kitchen begins to take on a bit of a shoddy look. That being said, I've probably seen more custom kitchen cabinets breaking down over the long term than that of Ikea, but they're typically around the doors as well. Not all custom cabinets are equal. For example, we could swap the melamine boxes for maple plywood construction. This will definitely increase the durability, but it also brings a few moisture issues into play. It also costs significantly more, and I had several quotes that pushed this same design well over the $20,000 mark. I think the point I'm really trying to make here is that these categories we've created for cabinets, whether it's RTA, semi-custom, custom, don't really exist. It's all of a sliding scale from poor quality to amazing quality. And it's not one individual component that's gonna make up or decide which category it falls into. It's the entire construction, the design, and the materials used in those cabinets that's gonna place it somewhere on that sliding scale. If you've stuck around to this point in this video, you're a trooper. I can already tell this is going to be a long one. And you might also be wondering, well, it doesn't seem like there's a clear cut winner between IKEA and custom cabinets. And it's kind of true. Each system does have its benefits. But what ultimately pushed us towards the custom cabinets was really a threefold reasoning of why. First, we could remove all of those small annoyances that come with an IKEA kitchen without any added cost. Second, the cost of custom cabinets plus installation is exactly the same as IKEA with aftermarket doors. And third, the cabinet builder is also part of the install team. And I cannot begin to tell you how much this can affect the overall smoothness of a project and the installation of kitchens. Alas, I think I'm going to end it here. This one is dragged out long enough. If you have any particular questions or comments or want me to dive into aspects of the design in any greater detail, leave a comment down below and I'll try and do it in another video or a short or maybe even just an answer. As always, thanks a ton for watching, especially if you've hung around in this long video, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.